I Hello see there, folks. I see quite a few joining us. All right. I'm going to look in this out. I see Amy Harridan. Hope Jay is with you. And the provost himself joining us. Today. Oh, my goodness, Dr. Huntful. <laughs> Frank Whitson in Florida, I'm thinking. Karen Regenbaum, Mark Caulfield. All right, I know these names. Pam Nobles, look at this, this is great. Nice list. Very nice, and they keeps growing. Every time someone else joins in, it bumps around. Ben Molina, one of our more recent alums. All right. Nice to see so many people interested in Learning about the Watershed Institute on a, on a Thursday evening. It's a beautiful evening. Absolutely. Pam Nobles from our Alumni Board of Directors. Absolutely. Karen Regenbaum, our, one of our trustees. Hi, Karen. Class of 81, all right. Excellent. Don't forget to include where you're joining us from. We love to know where you're at. Class of 84, class of 81, it's really neat. All right, we're getting close. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our first Smitty Story Hour of the new academic year. Um, we took the summer off. Um, let's be honest, after we did a presentation on Gold Point, I needed a few days. <laughs> to recover, which turned into a few months. Anyway, here we are in September, classes are well underway. Um, the Smitty Story Hour is brought to you by the Pelsmans College Alumni Association. Past presentations have been recorded and are on our website, pelsmans.edu backslash alumni. Um, there's one recording missing. Um, we had some internet and network difficulties and that recording is lost forever. So we may have to invite Joe Canto to present to us again at a later date. Um, anyway, tonight we have joining us, Dr. Dan Kelting. He's our vice president for research and the executive director for the Adirondack Watershed Institute. I think I'm gonna give just one more minute, Dan, in yep. case got somebody else joining us. I thought there's a name I'm not seeing here that I thought was joining no us. Worries. Um, we will record this session. It's actually already being recorded. Is that right? Yes. Excellent. Um, that means I remembered to click the button when I, I see it says recording. Yes. Excellent. So happy. Oh, cool. uh, Class of 2020. Yeah. Ben Molina. That was last November, he graduated. That's awesome. I think that's right. Is that right, Ben? I think that's right. Um, I think you have 40, over 40, uh, 50 years of alumni. Yeah, we've got some. Yep, yeah, there's Frank Whitson, Jansen Beach. Next time we go to Florida, Steve, we got to meet with Frank. Count me in. Okay. He's a, uh, a Jersey native. We don't hold it against him, of course. Um, he's also, he was very active with the Pulse Miss Gabriel's Fire Department. So, um, Pam Nobles in Pennsylvania. Pam, are you class of, oh, I'm not gonna guess. Never mind. I'm not gonna guess what class year. I could look it up. Um, Wow, you're a long way from Paul Smith, Andrew Murphy. Oh, he grew up seven miles away, but now he's in Pensacola. <laughs> That's awesome. And who's this guy from West Jay Z? <laughs> that would be the boss. All right, Dan, I think where we're, we're going to be. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Dan Kelting, 
Again, he is the Vice President of Research for Paulsmas College and the Executive Director of the Adirondack Watershed Institute right here on campus. Great. Take it away, Dan. Thanks a lot, Heather. We've got my screen up now, hopefully. Yes. Awesome. Well, it's, it's a real pleasure to be speaking with you all this evening. It was a lot of fun to see the names scrolling in and, and the, uh, the years of alumni. Uh, we've got a few alumni on our staff at AWI, which I will talk about as, as part of my presentation this evening. I thought first start out by just telling you about a little bit about myself. Um, so actually, I, I, I guess since there's a full disclosure, I, I was actually born in New Jersey, uh, but I don't remember it because I was literally we moved to Malone, New York when I was six months old. So, so but technically I am, a, I am from New Jersey, but, but uh, I, I definitely identify with Northern New York as, as my home. Uh, so grew up in Malone, so just 30 miles, 30 miles or or so north of Paulsmith College. My family, we were really lucky in Malone back. So this was in, uh, we moved there in 19, uh, 1960, late 1965. And we were really fortunate back then. There were a lot, of, a lot of young families with kids. And both of my parents were very outdoors uh, oriented as were a lot of the other families in the area. So they got together and formed uh, the Chattagay Woods chapter of the Adirondack a mountain club. So that was that, that was actually formed in the late 60s. And so I literally spent probably every weekend uh, uh, of my growing up years coming down to the Adirondacks, uh, going on paddling trips, hiking trips, uh, Nordic trips in the wintertime. So, so I was very quickly at a young age, very much, very much uh, rooted to, to, to the natural resources of this area. And that really, I, really uh, led me into my career path. So, so I, uh, when I, I knew about Paul Smith, actually, when I, so a lot of my friends uh, came to Paul Smith, Joe Connor, with, who you mentioned earlier, Heather, he and I graduated from high school together uh, back, back in 1983. So, so I know Joe, Joe, uh, Joe well. Uh, so so but he, went, he went into the, the hospitality culinary area. I had a lot of friends that went that route. I actually, uh, so kind of given my interest in the natural resources, I actually, my lifelong dream back then was to be a forest ranger. Uh, so I loved forest rangers, I used to help them carry their equipment when I was a kid and go up to the fire towers and whatnot. I went to ranger school, so that's a, so the other school in the Adirondacks that has a, has a tech degree. So I went there. I worked in forest industry for a number of years up in Maine uh, for, for international paper company, Diamond, Diamond Occidental. We used to be diamond, we used to make matches, a diamond match, which, which are still manufactured under a different name. I, so I worked in the industry as a technician. I was also doing a lot of land surveying up there in Maine. And then I went back to school to Syracuse and got my back bachelor's degree in, in forest resource management. Uh, worked out west for a period of time. Uh, actually, I worked in forest industry, but also I worked as a fisheries observer. Up in up in the Gulf of Alaska in the Bering Sea, uh, so a little bit different, a little bit different tack. But I was interested in seeing if I could do some other types of stuff besides forestry. I uh, so uh, after kind of bouncing around the country for a while, enjoying enjoying the country, I settled down into my graduate work at at Virginia Tech. So I, I went to Virginia Tech and first received my my master's degree there in in forest in forestry, focusing on actually tree physiology. And I stayed on there as a research associate for a couple of years and eventually continued to stay on there as, as, a, as a PhD student and candidate um, and graduated from there in, in January of 99 with my, with my PhD in forestry uh, with a focus on soils. After that, I actually moved to North Carolina. I worked at NC State University in Raleigh for about four and a half years. And, in the forestry program. And I was a co-director of an of a international research program actually called the Forest Nutrition Cooperative. We worked in every Southern state and also uh, Brazil, Colombia, Chile, and Argentina. So, so I worked all the, the real South, the real South, South of the equator as well as South of the Mason Dixon line. So uh, did a lot of work with, with the industry focused on uh, really on pine plantation, civil culture, uh, I, I think there was someone from Florida on the call, so you can, you can attest there's a lot of pine plantations down in that neck of the woods. And I spent a lot of my time in, in Florida in those, in those years. 
I uh, had it end up back here. So, so back in, um, in 2003, I had a graduate student. I was helping, helping him look for, look for work. And we were scrolling through this website at the time. And I saw, hey, there's this job at Paulson's College, uh, director of the Adirondack Watershed Institute. And I kind of set that aside. I didn't want him to, him to get a closer look at that job. I thought maybe I'd want to take a look at myself. So, so I revisited that job description and, and uh, thought, wow, I, I could, there's a potentially a job, a professional job for me back in the Adirondacks, where, my place where I grew up and truly, truly love. And actually in water resources, which is an area I've always very was always very interested in professionally. So kind of kind of wrapped that all up. I I so I moved up here. I convinced my young wife at the time, who was a native Virginian, uh, to to relocate from 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 the south to the, to the far north uh, in in the fall of two thousand three. And and so that's that's I was recruited specifically to be the be the executive director of the Ad Adirondack Watershed Institute, as, in addition to teaching. Uh, Watershed management and forest soils were the two courses I was responsible for when I, when I joined the faculty at Pulse Medicine in 2003. So I've been on this job for for 18 18 years. Is I've been at Pulse Medicine. And I have to say, I've, it's the best decision of my professional life it was to relocate here to Pulse Medicine College. It's a wonderful place. The students are absolutely amazing. The, the faculty and staff. It's just it was it was a great it was a really just a great move for me. So I'm thrilled. Thrilled to be here tonight, and thrilled to really talk to you about the Watershed Institute and how we've how we've kind of grown over over the years, and, and really become a real. Uh, hopefully, you'll see through this presentation a, a real regional player and factor in in a lot of areas related to water resource management and Adirondacks, so and beyond, actually. So, hope you'll feel a sense of pride at Smitty's uh, to see this organization growing and, and serving the needs of the people at Adirondacks. <clears throat> So a little, a little brief history of kind of how, how the Adirondack Watershed Institute uh, got its name, so to speak. Um, so that begins uh, with, a, with a program that was formed in 1992 called the Adirondack Aquatic Institute. And this program was actually formed at the behest of Lake Association. So up the Upper St. Regis Foundation, Upper Saranac Lake Association, uh, we're actually working with faculty at Paul Smith College and under a variety of different uh, a variety of different names of programs uh, over over quite a number of years. Pat Flat is probably a name that some of you on the on this call remember. Chemistry professor worked with uh, worked with her students and actually they did a lot of the sampling of of, of St. Regis Lakes of Upper Saranac Lake back in the day and. Um, uh, EET students were, were heavily involved in, in, in working with the lakes. And so from all that work, it, it, this, this program was formed, it's called the Adirondack Aquatic Institute. It was pretty much focused on sampling the lakes kind of around the Pulse Miss, Pulse Miss area, the sort of the Tri Lakes, Tri Lakes area, with, if you will, and a couple of a couple of other locations beyond. So water, water quality monitoring is what they were all about. A little bit later, about eight years later, there's a program that was formed called the Watershed Stewardship Program. And, and like a lot like the Adirondack Aquatic Institute, the stewardship program was actually formed at the behest or request of, of a lake association. So that's the upper St. Regis folks came to Paul Smith and, and they were very concerned back in back in the late 90s about aquatic invasive species, which was which was pretty progressive back then for a lake association to be concerned. They had they had no invasive species in their lakes at that time. They still don't have any, uh, so they wanted to form a stewardship program, put some of that launch site, and so they came to the college uh, to, to ask the college to start a program. And of course, they helped fund fund the beginning of the program. And Dr. Eric, Eric Holman was the original director of that program. So we had these two programs kind of running side by side for a number of years, a uh, couple of years, and uh, actually the provost of the college at that time had the idea of we've got these programs are pretty similar. One's focused on water quality, others, others focus on aquatic invasive species. Maybe we should bring them together and see if there's some synergies and create under one roof. So, so in 2002, the Adirondack Watershed Institute uh, name was formed. And, and you can see the boat there, that, that boat was one of our early purchases. We were able to get the, and it sits proudly on the side, Paul Smith College Adirondack Watershed Institute. It's a wonderful boat. We still have it's our primary primary research vessel. So I came on board uh, as the first director in 2000. It, it, it searched for a while and I came on board 
in August of 2003 to be the director of this program that was formed from, from this other program. So when I arrived, this, is, this was sort of the picture. Um, so I was part-time, I, I was a part-time teaching, part-time director. Uh, there were no staff. Uh, we had a very small budget through, through the contract work that we did, maybe around $100,000 a year. We, had our, we didn't have our own space on campus. Uh, I actually moved five times in five years, which is okay, because right, I got to see different parts of the campus. And, and, and we were very much a locally focused program. So uh, meaning most of our work was focused around the, really the Paul Smith, Tri-Lakes kind of area. We, we weren't really known much outside the local area. So what about today? So we, Paul Smith College out around the Watershed Institute. 20, 2021. So, so, so we're, we're going to we're moving up, up and up to 19 years and what's what's happened. Uh, before that, I want to talk about uh, uh, this beautiful, this beautiful water resources that we have here in the Ironics that you all are familiar with. As folks that went to Paul Smith, so you got to enjoy Laura St. Regis just by looking out your window. But we have uh, uh, over depending on how how small the polygon you make for the lake size. Any, about 11,000 lakes and ponds in the Adirondacks, and over 30,000 miles of rivers and streams. We are a, a surface water rich region of the country, as you know. So just a couple of iconic images here, upper left. We have Blue Mountain Lake moving over on the same, on the top panel. We have the Al Sable River, um, Kitty Corner down on the bottom. We have Buttermilk Falls and the Racket River and sliding over on the bottom, we can see you can see uh, Lower Saranac Lake. Just, just a couple of images of, of what we all know from being the Adirondacks, of just the just tremendous water resources that we have in the park. And we love it. We all love, I think everybody that lives here, uh, if they can, uh, love to enjoy our waters. Uh, one way is we get a lot of tourists that come and, and they enjoy waterside lodge, lodging like Mirror Lake Inn on, on Mirror Lake. Recreational water sports, uh, getting towed on a on a uh, inner tube behind a boat, wa water skiing, jet skiing, all these different sports. Others like sailing, kayak, and canoeing as well. Just a lot of water sports that I enjoy in the Adirondacks. Fishing, fly fishing, the iconic uh, uh, stretches of the rivers, the Al Sable and others. Boquette. Camping. Every, most of us like to camp. Actually, I'm going. Uh, I've got a family camping trip planned for Friday and Saturday night on. On middle Saranac with my family. So, so I also enjoy these things. So all these kind of activities we enjoy. One, one thing that we all do, we all drink the water. So, so we can't live without water, uh, literally. We, you all know that. So we, not only do we depend on our water for recreational pursuits and just, and just our peace of mind, we, we depend on our water for our health. We, we drink water. So if we think about water in the Adirondacks, uh, clean water is really vital to our economy. We, can't, we really can't live without it. Our, 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 our tourism-based economy is really based around water. So just some statistics here. You get about $1.2 billion in expenditures by visitors to the Adirondacks every summer. These are tourists. Of those, 85% desire waterside lodging, 70% recreate in or on the water. So clearly uh, water is, is central. And about 26,000 jobs are supported by, by tourism. And, and you can extrapolate that quite a number of these jobs are directly related to water. Um, so very important. The other very important feature is water, waterfront property is our most valuable, pro valuable property. Uh, so we receive a lot of property taxes, uh, tax revenue, our, our school taxes come largely in many places come from the value of waterfront property. So, so keeping our waters clean and healthy is not only certainly important for our ecosystems, absolutely, but very much important for, for our economy and our socioeconomic well-being here in the Adirondacks. So really that's, so our mission, uh, the mission of the watershed is to really focus around protecting this resource. So it's quite simple. We're about protecting clean water. You know, we wanna, we wanna protect the waters that we have that are clean. And if they're damaged in any way, we wanna help restore, help them recover back to their natural state. We wanna protect clean water and we wanna pr promote healthy watersheds from which that clean water, from which that clean water in that rise depends. So our mission is to protect clean water and promote healthy watersheds. And we accomplish our mission through three focal areas. 
Uh, the first is science. So we are, we lead with, we say we lead with science. So we are very much a science-based organization, uh, creating new knowledge through our scientific work and communicating it uh, through the various, in various formats. We thought I'd give an example of in a minute. We are uh, all about stewardship. So, so boots on the ground, stewardship of our natural resources, which I'll elaborate more on in a minute. And our mission is compass through community. So what we mean by that is in meaningful engagement with the Adirondack community, the, the community of stakeholders in the Adirondacks, from local government to schools, to, to NGOs, to individuals, like associations, community engagement uh, uh, to, to uh, have meaningful change. And, and I'll, I'll mention a little bit about that too. I'm still gonna elaborate on all three. First, thinking about science, our science is really focused on understanding threats to clean water and, and healthy watersheds. So the things that we, main things that we work on right now are, are you may, may know road salt, which I'll say a little bit more about in a minute. Uh, we work on recreational pressure. There's a lot of concern right now about overuse, uh, not only in the high peaks, but also overuse of our surface waters. Uh, think marine expansions, et cetera, that, uh, in our park, how that impacting the waters themselves and, and the use of those waters. So we work on that. Uh, we work heavily uh, on invasive species, understanding biology and, and, and also uh, effectiveness of management techniques. Uh, we work on understanding a runoff and algal blooms. Harmful algal blooms in the Adirondacks are rare, but they're starting to occur more and more. So we have work trying to understand those mechanisms as well. Uh, we work on land use. And so, so we think about having a healthy watershed means having a properly laid out and, and land uses and, and proper development to ensure that that water is getting into the ground and getting to the surface water, groundwater and surface water in clean, clean and orderly fashion. And, and the last threat we work on, which is probably the largest one and most challenging is climate change. And we're all familiar, we're living that now, looking at how climate change is affecting our water resources. So those are the things that we work on. And our science is really about solutions. So, so we're not just doing scientific work for science sake. We, we're looking to, to do work that's gonna help, uh, help us solve problems and to help inform management and policy. So just a couple of examples. We've been, for years, we've been doing work to manage aquatic invasive species. Here's a variable leaf milfoil, here's a dive crew. And a question, a very, uh, very legitimate question here is, what's the effectiveness of these practices? Are, is, is hand harvesting, which is what you're seeing here, is this an effective mechanism for, for managing uh, the Eurasian water, variable leaf milfoil in this case, or, or aquatic invasive species in general? So we study, we study these techniques to see uh, if they're effective or not and report out. Uh, we, we observe our lakes very closely. Um, I'll talk about in a, few, in a minute or two our Adirondack Lake Assessment Program, where we're gathering critical data on the lakes and then, and then looking at what's impacting water quality. So one of those impacts we've been looking at, as I mentioned earlier, is, is looking at road salt and how it's been impacting both surface and groundwater resources here in the park. And so as scientists, we publish. So, so we publish our work in peer-reviewed journals. And so here's an example. Of the, so the one on the far left is, is a publication we did looking at the effectiveness of of hand harvesting to control Eurasian water milfoil. And this particular publication was very important because there's a lot of discussion on whether, whether it was worthwhile to spend money hand harvesting these, these organisms from lakes. So the state of New York was very reticent to, to issue permits for harvesting. Also, they, they're resident, 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 pick a different word, uh, reluctant, reluctant to uh, provide uh, public resources in terms of state funding and grants to support management. So this particular paper helped, helped uh, move the needle, if you will, for the state to release funds for management and also permit hand harvesting as a, as a preferred choice for managing aquatic invasive species, particular to milfoils in the Adirondack. So that was from science, applied science. Uh, the next two papers here are related, related to our work on road salt, which is a, a from our work on lake monitoring and, and, and various modeling things that we do with geographic information systems. But this work has probably been our, probably our signature work uh, uh, in terms of our, in terms of one of our major contributions to water resources here in the Adirondacks and policies around them. So I just want to elaborate a little bit more on the road salt one. So we've all been there, right, behind the truck. And so 
Uh, this is probably a, a, one of the better examples you'll see of how science can inform management policy. So here I am driving behind a salt truck and they're, and they're, they're uh, performing what's called anti-icing, putting the salt down before, before the snow. And so we were very much involved. I spent many years with a group of people communicating our science and Albany to legislators, to, to DOT commissioner, DEC commissioner, Department of Health commissioners, and, uh, and, and other folks as well. And, and the culmination of that was a, a legislation. So we have the Randy Preston Road Salt Reduction Act, which was bipartisan legislation that was signed into law on December 2nd, 2020. And that's me standing there, how, how, how Billy Jones asked me to stand, stand up and talk about the, the, the science and how that, all, how, how that all works in terms of passing this law. And you can see it, see on the bottom, reducing salt uses the Adirondacks legislation named after Randy, who is, Randy was the chair of our grassroots group that, that worked hard together for a number of years to get this done. But it's an excellent example of science informing management policy, and it, and it comes directly from our work uh, at the Adirondack Water State Institute to, to, to get that done. So I wanted to share that with you just as an example of kind of our, our DNA as, a, as an organization in terms of how we view science and as, as, a, as, a, as part of a means to, to affect positive change of, for the benefit of our water resources here in the Adirondack. So a little bit about stewardship. So, so we, uh, we have the stewardship program. So we have the Watershed Stewardship Program that, that, that was founded in 2000 that still exists within AWI as a, as a series of stations around the Adirondack Park. And, this program is, is the largest and most respected aquatic invasive species pro program in New York State. And so we have, we have what are called boat stewards uh, stationed at over 65 boat launch sites in the Adirondacks. You can see all the dots on the map, uh, an area larger than the state of Vermont uh, uh, that, we have to, that we manage in terms of invasive species. So we have these stewards at launch sites. We also have uh, deployed around the park, decontamination stations to decontaminate vessels that are moving between water bodies. And so what we do is we hire every summer about a hundred or so uh, individuals to work with us, about half of those or so Paulsmith students. And these individuals are at boat launch sites, they're performing boat inspections, so, so looking for invasives, but more importantly, they're actually providing boater education. So they're talking to boaters about why they should care about invasive species, the steps they can take to to ensure that their vessels and gear and trailers and whatnot are, are, not, are not harboring invasives and that they're not part of the problem. So really helping, helping to educate boaters so that they're doing the right thing in terms of not, not uh, transporting invasives and inadvertently infecting water bodies as they move around the park. So that's a critical service that, that they perform in terms of stewardship. And the other one is we have um, 30, 30 boat decontamination stations around the Adirondacks. And what these are used for is we have organisms, we call them small bodied organisms, uh, aging plants, zebra mussels, spiny water flea, quagga mussel, and others. The only way to ensure that these organisms are, are not on the boat and gear is to actually uh, perform a high pressure hot water decontamination. So we have these stations around the park and we have, have our decontamination technicians that are, are performing that service in the Adirondacks. Again, it's, it's, it's stewardship to protect Adirondack waters from invasive species. And it's actually the largest such program uh, west of the Mississippi, west of the Mississippi River. Our other example of stewardship is the Adirondack Lake Assessment Program. This is a program that was actually started under the Adirondack Aquatic Institute back in, back in the 90s. And this is a citizen science-based volunteer monitoring program. And it's, it's very large now. We have a, over 80 wa water uh, lakes participating in the program. And just like with the stewardship program, it's actually the largest uh, program in the region. This one's focused on water quality. It's also the oldest. It's been around for a lot. We have over 20 years of data or participation uh, in this program. And yet, so the data sets become very, very valuable. As I mentioned earlier, it's data from this program that, that we use to, to see the connection, uh, show the connection between road salting practices and, and increases in salt concentrations in our, in our lakes and our streams in the Adirondacks. So it's been a very, very important in that regard. So part of, the, part of the program is really uh, about empowering volunteers. So we train, uh, we train volunteers uh, to, to sample their lakes uh, and also 
by doing that, we're empowering them. They're out there, they're out there on the water bodies and doing the work themselves and building their own sense of stewardship and the resources that they're that they're helping us to protect along with them. So community, our next area. So here with community, it's really, really it's about engagement. So you can see these two, two images on the top. The one on the left is actually the conference room here in the Pelosi Center. You see, you can see our provost right over there in the far corner. But this is a meeting we, so uh, I mentioned earlier, I meet, I meet with elected officials a fair amount. Here we had, we were fortunate to have Senator, Senator Betty Little and her staff come visit us and, and some local leaders in the Lake, uh, Lake Association realm. And here we're talking to them about, about uh, invasive species, about, about uh, water qualities, drinking water, uh, surface water, fisheries, and, and just really uh, uh, from a science perspective, trying, trying to help them understand the, the, the threats to the resources, what, and, but more importantly, what we can do, what steps we can take to, to, uh, to protect the resources and, and uh, minimize the threats. So really working with public officials, uh, the next slide, next uh, picture over, you can see that this Sue O'Reilly, one of our permit team members, with uh, a, a container full of invasive plants, tabling at a, at a lake, the Adirondack Lake Alliance annual meeting, which was held on Paulson's College pre-COVID, our campus. It'll come back hopefully soon. But uh, help, again, engaging with Lake Association members in this image to, to help them understand the threats and, and, and help them make science-based decisions for, for the benefit of their water bodies that they're associated with. So engagement. Uh, this bottom uh, picture shows a couple of other forms of engagement. So we're fortunate at the Adirondack Watersheds to uh, Deputy Director Zoe Smith is, is one of the co-founders of what's called the Common Ground Alliance, which is a, which is a grassroots alliance of of stakeholders throughout the Adirondacks that come together to, to identify and work on common issues and bring them actually to Albany, uh, to legislators and the executive branch to affect change for the Adirondacks. So, so the bottom left panel, that's Zoe is facilitating a breakout group on road salt. And it was actually from this group meeting that the Randy Preston Road Salt Reduction Act came into fruition. So, so it came to fruition, if you will, through presenting the science in this format and then bringing that forward up through various channels to, to affect that change. The bottom pa left panel is myself uh, talking uh, with Lake Association members about how to, how to interpret their water quality report. So they get the water quality report. What does it mean? Uh, how can they present it to their, their, their town supervisors at a town meeting so that the town supervisors are informed about the data and what it's saying and, and then what they should be thinking about in terms of of resource allocation to help protect the lakes within our town. Because as I said earlier, the lakefront property is the most valuable property. So it's up, it's a town supervisor should know what's happening with those lakes to help protect those waters. So here I am talking to lake association members to, to help them understand their report. So then they're feeling empowered to go use that same data to, to go talk to their local collective officials. Another area of community engagement we have in the Institute is, is really working with youth. And this is through a, a program we call our Water, Water Shield Workshops. So it's, it's an it's a educational program for, for children from middle school up through high school. And so a couple of examples of that program, which has been running now for several years, are, are edu teaching children how to inspect their equipment. So searching for aquatic invasive species in this case on a jet ski and its associated trailer, first talking about them about the threats and then, and then having them inspect. And children tend to be very, uh, very interested in, in protecting the water. So we're, we're reaching out to the children and then, then they can reach out to their parents and say, hey mom or hey dad, did you inspect the boat trailer, the jet ski trailer before we launched it or after we launched it? So, so engaging with the youth right away to get them to be the ambassadors and, and working with their parents. Here we're, we're, uh, we have this watershed model that we use it's, uh, to, to, uh, for youth to understand what we call point non-source pollution. So how, how human activities in the watershed impact water quality. So we have a number of kids here that are enjoying working with, this is Zach Sinek, a Paul Smith grad, who now works for the Nature Conservancy at Akeem Valley, uh, who was working with us at that time, running that model for the, for the kids so they would understand watersheds and watershed functions and, that, and how to protect water. 
we bring kids out of the water. So, so here we are on our floor. We have a floating classroom. We actually have the only, only uh, traveling floating classroom in the Adirondacks. So we go, go to different lakes and offer these programs. So doing a plankton tow to see, see those critters, what are those critters doing in the lake and, and, and what do they look like? Why are they important? What do we think about them? So an example of community engagement at the, at the level, of, level of children and, 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 and educating them about water resources. A new event that we launched, uh, we launched last year, actually during COVID, so 2020. Uh, and this this event is is one that we're, we we did it again this year. And the, the plan here, the vision is is for Adirondack. So this is Adirondack Water Week, the last full week of August. And, and the idea here is to really focus efforts, uh, focus our minds and 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 our thoughts around valuing our precious waterways here in the Adirondacks. So we spent the whole summer out there enjoying the waters of the Adirondacks. Hey, let's take a week and, 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 uh, and reflect, and reflect on those water bodies. So, so Water Week is, is really a, an event we expect to grow uh, to, be a, to be a very significant event over, over the next several years to be park-wide uh, with a focus on water resources. Uh, so it, it, you can see on the bottom the kinds of activities that we have, so engaging with families and fun activities, like I showed the previous slide, guided trips and paddling trips, formal scientific lectures. Uh, we have this thing called Wool and Water, which I'm gonna show you a picture of in a minute, so science meets art. River cleanups or calls to action and any other kinds of activities uh, fall underneath this Water Week banner. And, and right now, it's, this is a, an event that's actually co-sponsored co and developed by us, Paul Smith College, but also Northwood School. In, in Lake Placid, uh, which has a beautiful uh, facility on Main Street called the Northwood Innovation Hub that, we're, that we're, we've been able to um, utilize for this event and also for the college in general to get, the, get Paul Smith on Main Street, Lake Placid, and also the Adirondack Park and Basic Plant, Plant Program. So our, our, our three organizations working together to, to, to have this event. So, so a little bit more about this as our latest, our latest uh, uh, community engagement uh, mechanism. So here is an image. So we're, we're looking. We're in the hub. Uh, so you can see we're table tabling in the hub. Uh, so this is you're looking out on Main Street, Lake Placid. Beautiful, beautiful location. It used to be where with Pike and Book was. If you remember that store it was re renovated and turned into this space by Northwood, and it's owned by Northwood. So we had inside here a number of tables with information. Uh, displayed. Uh, we were open during the week. Folks would come in and, and, and we would talk to them, answer their questions about water quality. We also developed a self-guided tour of the Mirror Lake watershed where they could use their smartphone to, to tour around the watershed and learn about the important features and stormwater runoff and best management practices and, and many other things about, about watersheds uh, so they would become educated as well as just get some good exercise walking up around the watershed. Uh, within the hub, we also, uh, I showed you the had a number of games that we had available through the whole week. Families, lots of families came in off the street to with their kids, particularly when it rained. They were looking for stuff to do with it when they're on vacation, came in and, and learned about uh, uh, watersheds and water pollution with this model, but also got to play some other games and build fake bracelets and, and color and work with coloring books and other things just to get them to have fun and think about think a little bit about water as they were on vacation like classic. And what, Another cool that, thing that we did, and this was at the VIX, so, so the Water Week just didn't happen at the hub in Lake Placid, it was just our central location, it was all over the Adirondacks. We had an awesome display at the Pulse Visitors Interpretive Center by Dr. Michaeli Glennon, who's our science director at the Adirondack Water Institute. And she is an, an amazing knitter. So something that she did, you can see wool and water here. Michaeli actually interpreted science, scientific data from our, from our uh, water monitoring program in wearable wool products. So, so you can see that these products are on display. Uh, and she was at the VIC to talk about this work. And it's, you know, it's, uh, it's under the, the uh, STEAM, right? Uh, uh, science, technology, uh, engineering, arts, and, and math. So really, really bridging the gap between, between the creative arts and, and the science. And actually now this, uh, she's a traveling road show. This show is going all over the, Northern New York now, so so really neat kind of thing, bringing in the art, art element in with the science to, to engage other people in, into uh, thinking about water and value in different ways. 
So that's so that's kind of what we do. And, and uh, now I want to transition and talk talk a little bit about our kind of how how we're paid, a little bit about our our, our workforce development, our staff, and our in our facilities. So just to give you a sense of us as an organization. So I mentioned back in uh, back in uh, 2003, we were maybe about $100,000 a year was our total total revenue, our budget for the organization. We're now we're now uh, over three million dollars a year in revenue, and that's all external money. So the Hallsmith College Adirondack Watershed Institute has is, raises all its own funding to support the programs that I've just shown you through through a number of mechanisms. So we're, we are not supported. We are not supported by the college budget. So so we, we are so we are supported by raising funds through our own through our own uh, means. So looking at this graph, you can you can see. Almost three quarters, of our, three quarters of our funding comes through state grants. We do have a very large uh, five-year contract with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation to run that large uh, stewardship program, the boat inspection decontamination program. It's a $10 million contract for five years and we're actually in negotiations to, to renew it uh, starting next year. So a very important source of funding. We also receive a number of federal grants uh, through Lake Champlain Basin Program, the Great Lakes uh, Restoration Initiative, Environmental Protection Agency, National Science Foundation, and others to support support our work. And then the rest of our funding comes through. We do have an annual fund. We do take donations. Uh, we receive funding from lake associations to do very specific work on lakes. And we also have uh, projects funded through private private foundations. So all of that adds up to just under 3.2 million. And, that, and that's a pretty stable, that number has been pretty stable over the last few years. Uh, in terms of what we spend that money on, so we don't spend it all. So, so we spend just under 3.1 million. So, so we have a net we have a net surplus in terms of in terms of our our our, uh, our revenue and expenses. Most of that money comes to no surprise to anybody that runs a business goes to uh, paying staff salaries. So we have 13 full time staff at the institute. Uh, so that's about just over 25 percent of our expenditure, and we have 120 seasonal staff. Uh, which is about 50% of our expenditure uh, with, with the remainder going to travel supplies. And, and our third largest expense is what we call indirect costs. This is about $500,000 a year that goes to the college. Uh, in addition to the surplus, that's, that's money that goes to the college in terms of indirect cost recovery from grants that are available to support the college in, a, in other ways. So, so that's how, uh, that's our, um, our, our ledger, if you will, for the Institute. Uh, so we're very well funded. In terms of a program, could always use more, uh, but uh, but uh, and then and that funding is going really uh, to do the to do the work that I showed you and to provide a lot of really great jobs. So I want to talk about the jobs a little bit. So we are in the workforce development business uh, at Paul Smith College, right? So we're we're educating the next workforce in a variety of different disciplines. The Adirondack Watershed Institute is also in the workforce development business, or i.e. jobs. And over 100 seasonal jobs and positions every year tends to be around 120. And so, what are those folks doing? Primarily, these are these are the folks that are working within our aquatic invasive species prevention and restoration program, performing boat inspections, uh, decontaminations. This is a great this is great workforce development uh, for these folks because they're having to interact with people, so they have to learn how to communicate, uh, to talk to people about invasive species, deal with people that perhaps aren't interested in talking to them. So they're having to deal with conflict resolution. Uh, so the really great opportunity, learning opportunities and development opportunities professionally for these students, learning how to collect data. Uh, so the bottom panel, you can see Stuart actually using a, a tablet to collect data on for, for the program and do some reporting. So valuable skills being used, learned by all these people every summer. We also provide jobs uh, in our lab, temporary jobs in our laboratory. Uh, so I'll show you another image of laboratory in a minute, but we have a wonderful laboratory facility here in the Plosey Center where we're based. This gentleman is Hunter Fabro. Hunter is a, gra a graduate from Paulson's College and worked with us in our lab for, as, a, as a temporary employee for a while. He's now the uh, QAQC officer for bionic testing in Saranac Lake. Uh, so he, but he got his workforce development start here at Paul Smith with his education and then working for the Institute. Uh, that we also uh, hire people in the summer to do help with our outreach program. 
Uh, the, the gentleman there on the right is Jeff Sand, who worked for, for, for us for a number of years, who very much into education. And Jeff is actually now a high school science teacher. So he went from working with us as a summer educator to, to becoming an actual full-time educator. So all these great opportunities uh, that provided through, through first through going to Bell Smiths and then, then working with the Institute uh, to, for, for them to be able to move forward in their career goals. Uh, I wanted to show, so this is our, we actually have um, um, a large number of our staff at the AWI are Paul Smith's alumni. So I wanted to show you, show you their faces and walk you through them. So starting in the top left corner. So we have, first we have eight, eight of our staff members right now are Paul Smith's alumni, uh, six, six of our full-time staff and two of our more long-term seasonal staff. So Brendan Wilsey joined a AWI as our water quality director uh, a year and a half ago. He's a 2007 graduate of Paul Smith's College. Elizabeth Yerger, who's our laboratory manager, actually the second, second full-time employee to join AWI. I graduated in 2010 from the environmental science program at Paul Smith's. Eric Paul is, directs our stewardship program. He's a 2012 Paul Smith's graduate. Heather Kalitz is a, a program manager within AWI. And she, she wears a lot of hats, helps with a lot of different things. It's very good with spreadsheets and, and modern uh, project management software like Monday and, and things like that. And so she's a 2014 graduate of Paul Smith's. Brandon, Brent Winsat in the bottom left side is a 2017 graduate. He runs our decontamination program. So he's our decontamination manager full-time. Then next to him, we have Connor Vera, who's also a 2017 graduate. He's a research technician, does a lot, works in both the lab and the field. Uh, next to him is Isaac Stouffer, who's a 20, 2018 graduate of Paul Smith College. He's also a research technician that works in both lab and the field. And our, our most recent hire and most recent graduate from Paul Smith is, is Jolene Hall, a 2020 graduate. And she is a research assistant uh, working, working in the laboratory under, under the supervision, direct supervision of Liz Yerger. And Liz actually also supervises uh, Connor and Isaac uh, under, under her job title as lab manager. So, so we've got a great uh, team of Paul Smith graduates here working for us at the, at the Water Chase Institute. So a little bit about the Pelosi Center. So, so uh, we are based in the Pelosi Center. The Pelosi Center was a building that was uh, that was uh, finished construction and we moved into in 2010. I mentioned in the beginning that we had no physical home when I first started in 2003. Now we have this facility, it's about 5,000 square feet. Uh, the top floor is office space and bathrooms and a conference room and the bottom floor is our laboratory facility. Uh, it's been transformational for us. So uh, yeah, having a place where we, are, we could all be under one roof is just very important for, for building co unit cohesion and, and that water cooler talk. and and all the important tangible things that happen when you're all working in the same building. Uh, a shot of the top floor. So, so there's our main hallway uh, on the left. And so you have offices going off of there. Our one big room on the top floor, is not that big is our conference room. And you can see this is actually a picture I took today. Here's a group of students that I work with that, are, that receive scholarships from the National Science Foundation. And so we're, we're working in, in the room. You can see it's pretty crowded. Uh, it's not really made to have a a lot of people in it. Uh, so we're actually in the process of, of labeling pin flags for a forestry experiment we're working on related to road salt. Uh, so we're using the conference room sort of as a classroom uh, for, for students at the college. Looking downstairs is, is where the laboratory is. So that image on the bottom left is, is the central processing facility within our laboratory. It uh, looks nice and open and bright, it's beautiful. Uh, that's actually Isaac walking through there. Uh, that's a candid shot. And then looking on the, on the right-hand side, you can see our instrument room. That's where all of our, our, our high-tech equipment is, is running to do all the various tests that we do on water samples. That's Jolene, uh, our 2020 graduate, working in there on one of the instruments. You can see it's quite crowded in there. Uh, we've been successful in getting a lot of instruments put into our laboratory. But uh, just like the, the room above it, where it's quite crowded for, for using as a teaching space, our laboratory has become quite crowded in terms of uh, a, a usable space for instrumentation. So we've been very successful in our programming to the point where we're, we've outgrown our space and we need to, need to increase our space for, to continue to uh, serve the needs of the, of the communities that we work with, but also to, to, to uh, meet our mission and ultimate revision that we have for the program. 
So uh, we have a plan for expansion. This is where I want to want to leave you all. So looking at uh, looking at on the on the on this panel that just popped up, there's a new addition that we're planning that we're fundraising for for the lab. Uh, we want to have a dedicated teaching lab coming off the back of the building. This will free up our laboratory spaces that we have that we're using right now for a combination of teaching and research. Um, we have a vision and we're working very closely now with schools uh, in, in the Adirondack region. We would like to bring and have been bringing school, uh, high school kids in the STEM fields to Falls Smith College to the Adirondack Watershed Institute teachers. We wanna bring more of them to the college and actually have a dedicated lab space here at the, at the Institute that's coupled, co-located with our research facility so they, they can, can also get exposure to state-of-the-art research while they're coming here and, and uh, engaging with us on learning opportunities related to watersheds uh, in the Adirondacks. Looking uh, at, at the top level, uh, so we're, uh, the conference room that, that I mentioned that would be turned into office space and we'd add more office space to accommodate our, we're not 13 full-time staff, we only have six offices, so, so we need more office space. But also we wanna add a classroom. So, so I mentioned, I showed you the picture with the students working in the conference room. We want to add a larger classroom so we can actually uh, to be able to have students, more students in, in the facility, but also to, to host uh, uh, workshops for teachers and others, uh, weekend long workshops, immersion experiences, so we can have a one stop shopping in one facility. We have a, the traditional lecture space, you've got a teaching lab downstairs, you've got the office space and programmatic spaces to accommodate them. Uh, so I'm at the end. Uh, so, so Paul Smith College Adirondack Watershed Institute, we're about uh, prote protecting clean water, promoting healthy watersheds. And I want to leave you with our vision. So, so we, have a, we have a strong vision for the Adirondacks. And so I'll just read it to you. The, the AWI's vision for the future of the Adirondacks is that the lakes, rivers, and forests of the Adirondacks support clean water, healthy ecosystems, and vibrant communities whose citizens are inspired and empowered to protect the natural environment. So that's what we're working towards. That's one of the reasons why we have Water Week is to help empower the citizenry of the Adirondacks to, to also uh, help us protect these natural resources that we've all, all of us uh, on this call uh, certainly enjoy while you're at Paul's Fest and, and hopefully many of you still enjoy when you come back to the Adirondacks. So I'll leave it at that. And this is my, uh, this is the, my last slide. There's my contact information. If anybody wants to contact me via email or my phone number, uh, um, happy to happy to engage with anybody that's on on this uh, uh, Zoom uh, seminar tonight. And, and if you have any questions or, or just any follow up, um, we did have a question come in, Dan. Sure. Uh, Joanne Carpenter asks, "What parameters does the Water Monitoring Group measure?" Yeah, thanks. So, so we measure a, a, a number of parameters, and so. We, so we're interested in, in uh, really the main, the main things that we look at are uh, a suite of parameters related to what we call eutrophication or increase in lake productivity. So those parameters are, are transparency, uh, total phosphorus, um, and chlorophyll A as a measure of, of algal content in the lake. So we look at those. We also are, are interested in, in lakes response and recovery from acidification. So we look at, we also measure uh, uh, pH and alkalinity, which is a buffer. We're also very interested in salinization from salt. So we measure all the salts that we find in our water. So calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, uh, and, uh, as well as their analogs, chloride, sulfate, and, and nitrate. Uh, so those are, those are the main things uh, that we measure. Those, that's our, our standard suite, as well as we also look at uh, total nitrogen, total carbon, uh, dissolved oxygen. Um, those are our standard suite of things that we measure in our monitoring program. Great. Do we have any other questions from our group? I'm not seeing any others on here. Ben Molina mentions that he was a steward in 2019. Excellent. Um, I didn't personally realize how many alumni are full-time employees. Like I knew you had a lot of current students and alums that come back to you in the summer months, but I didn't realize how many were full-time, permanent, like year-round. Yeah. You have 
13 employees and it was eight that are yeah so we have 13 full-time year-round employees uh six of the 13 full-time year-rounders are pulse oh, right. alumni. Okay. and then then the two other pulse whistle alumni are are like long long-term uh season. excellent yeah. It's still yeah, amazing. It's yeah, it's still amazing. Um, really. Not that it's at all related, um, but when I was working at the Wabeek on Upper Saranac, at one point we had something like seventy-eight percent of our employees were Paul Smiths, either students or alumni, and I always love seeing that. Um, well, of course I do, but we do have another question. Um, do you have different concerns related to waters that travel to the St. Lawrence and the Hudson Rivers? Uh, so uh, right, so the um, so the Hudson River, of course, as you probably know from your question, that the source of the Hudson River is a, is summit of Mount Marcy. So that's where Lake Tear of the Clouds is is where the Hudson River watershed starts, and of course flows south and down, entering into New York Harbor. Uh, so within the so within the Hudson River watershed, and also within the St. Lawrence, the, the waters in the Adirondacks are draining with it into the St. Lawrence River watershed. Uh, we have the same concerns for those for those water bodies because they all they're all uh, um, many of them have uh, roads in their watersheds, so they're being exposed to road salt. Uh, many of them are there's different levels of development, so we're concerned about uh, uh, septic effluent, failing septic systems, erosion from from improper development. We're concerned about air pollution, uh, which is which is around the Adirondacks, more so in the southwest, and last it's moved to the northeast, but still a concern. We're, we're concerned about invasive species across the whole area. So I think the concerns uh, uh, they are they don't differ that much, really, really by a watershed. Uh, give, uh, when 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 we're still in the Adirondacks part of those watersheds, of course, once we get out, if you get down to the Lower Hudson and the Catskills, the concerns change. But as long as we're up in the Adirondacks. Uh, it, the, the concerns are pretty pretty darn similar across the Adirondack Park. Excellent, thank you. Sure. Um, any other questions? We're happy to answer them. Um, I I was really impressed, Dan. We hadn't talked much since the semester started, and I was like, "Gosh, I hope I didn't put too much pressure on him at the beginning of the school year." And no, he was fully ready. He didn't. <laughs> <laughs> totally ready for this. Um, I wanted to say, like Heather, you mentioned, that, so we um, we strive to hire as many Paulsmith students as we can. For, for, we prioritize hiring Paulsmith students uh, for all of our summer positions, and we typically have, uh, you know, the majority of our summer staff student workers are Paulsmiths, Paulsmith students, and actually we get many returners, so we'll get they'll come back. Uh, year after year, and that we do have promotional opportunities so they can go because we the region is so large. We have regional we have like regional supervisors, so they can come back and become a regional supervisor and get that managerial experience. So, um, so it's it's a really nice opportunity, and we try and we try as hard as we can to to have uh, have as many Paulsman students as we can working for us. And I had wondered what had happened with Jeff Sand. Can't believe yeah. he's a teacher now. That's amazing. Yeah, not awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thrilled. Um, thrilled for him. Uh, so I'm not seeing any other questions. So I want to thank you, Dan, for being our guest speaker this evening. Again, if you have any questions of Dan, you can reach out to him. He did leave his contact information. It's dkelting at posmos.edu. Um, and if you forget all that, just alumni at paulsmith.edu and I'll help you get in touch. Um, please do um, consider tuning in on October 14th. We are going to have a Smitty Story Hour all about George Peroni with some special guest speakers. Um, some alumni and um, past faculty members are gonna jump on and, and talk to us a little bit. And hopefully Luke Peroni um, will be able to join us as well. Um, possibly from Alaska, where he lives. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, again, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you, Dan. And um, this recording will be made available in the coming days on our website. So if you miss something, um, please do check the recording um, it's on our YouTube channel as well, as are all of the recordings that we had available. 
again, we did lose one in an internet issue in the spring, the day the network broke on campus. Yeah. <laughs> but, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And Thank you everybody. so much. Thank you. Thank you. And um, let's see, Amy, my best to Jay. I bet he's working. Chris Ruther, nice to see you on. Who else do we have here? Elizabeth, Frank Whitson, Homer. Homer, aren't you in Portland? Am I making that up? I'm in Portland, Oregon. I think you are. Yes, you are. That's where my oldest son lives. Jack Ward, Joanne Carpenter, Karen Regenbaum, hello to you, Mark Cofield. Nick Angevine, hello. All right, folks. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Oh, Amy, my best to your son too. Um, I don't know, is he still home? Where's he at now? He graduated and left me. I have no idea where he is. Let's see. He's at home at the master's program. That's great. Our Pulsemus master's program is really building. I'm so excited for that. All right. All right, folks. It's 8.01. I'm hoping to get home by 8.31. What do you think? All right. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we will see you hopefully October 14th at 7 p.m. We'll talk about George Peroni. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a good night.